Uh, so my name is Chris, thank you for the introduction, and uh, I'm talking about Mimix. So what is Mimix? Mimix is a collection of DARPA-funded software. It does two things. The first thing it does is it discovers content online, and the second thing is it brings it back for analysis. It's a, it's a new kind of search engine. And, and people ask a lot, like, why do we need a new kind of search engine? And the answer is because the internet is a lot bigger and more complex than, than most people think. Uh, the DA of New York calls it a, a 21st century crime scene. And to give you a sense, the kinds of people I work with, I partner with groups that have names like the Violent Chi Crimes Against Children Unit, uh, the Child Exploitation and Obscenity Section, uh, the National Security Council, the uh, Special Victims Bureau. Those are all places that need to understand content online. And what they're using right now, in many cases, are the same things that, that you and I use uh, to buy birthday presents and look for restaurants. They use existing commercial services like Google and Microsoft and Yahoo. And what I'll show you is sort of another way of doing things, a way that enables them to ask different kinds of questions and perhaps then uh, address their own issues. And in general, we call this domain-specific indexing and search. And we call this domain-specific in the sense of, what is your domain of interest? Uh, we're at OSU here, and maybe you're in material sciences and you want to understand the progression of the field by looking at journal articles over the last 60 years. Or if you're in law enforcement, maybe you're at the Oklahoma Bureau of Narcotics and you're asking questions about uh, victims of anti-human trafficking cases. Those are the kinds of questions that require analysis. And in general, what we're proposing are technology solutions that enable analysis as opposed to simple search. So we'll start here with a thing I'm showing on the screen. It's a map that you can't see very well, but at the center of it's Oklahoma City. And this map is a, a way in which Mimex has been used to crawl the internet to find online ads for sex and related services to make those available for law enforcement, prosecution, and victim outreach services. Now, the bigger the bubble on the map, the more ads we've seen in the last year. And if I hover over Oklahoma City, you'll see that there were 211,000 ads for sex online in the last year. In, in Stillwater here, it's a small dot, but it's still 12,500 ads. And if you're one of the officers at the Oklahoma Bureau of Narcotics, and you're assigned a case that has an ad like this, and you have 12,000 other ads in Payne County to ask questions about, if you're using Google, it's hopeless, essentially. Right? And so instead, you have these interfaces that have maps that show the collections of information. You also have interfaces that allow you to uh, search and look at individual ads. In this case, I've, I've queried uh, 405, the area code here, and uh, there are 264,000 results. Okay? So if you're doing this one at a time, looking at single ads, looking through Google, it's going to take you a long time, and, and you're going to miss a lot. And, and importantly, uh, it's, it's, it's impossible, actually. You may want to ask analysis questions. You may want to know, uh, given an ad here in Payne County, is it a, a single woman in a single incident? Is it a single location? Are there many locations? Are there many women or young boys? Is it just an entrepreneurial person, or is it actually a victim of human trafficking? These kinds of analysis questions, have you, have you seen this person before? Has this happened recently? Are they, are they advertised elsewhere and now they're here? Or is this the first time they've ever been seen on the internet? Those are questions that are really hard to ask and answer when you're querying things one at a time using uh, Microsoft Bing or, or, or Google, right? And so that's kind of what Mimex is. It's a, a collection of interfaces that look like a search engine interface that allow prosecutors, law enforcement, victim outreach, intelligence personnel to ask analysis questions so they can better allocate their resources, better issue subpoenas, open investigations, uh, issue indictments, and obtain convictions. And it's being used. Uh, it's being used, for example, now at the Special Victims Bureau in New York for every anti-trafficking case. It's a, a set of pilot partners we have that are testing it. And so far, it's proving to be quite useful because the alternative is, is what I'll show you next. They asked me when I came to start talking about ideas. And so what I want to show you now are kind of the three kinds of ideas that led to the creation of Mimex. So you get a sense for both why it's useful and, and how it works. The first thing I'll do here is play a video for you showing the way in which these investigations are conducted now. So although Mimex is a, a, a technology, the objective is to have domain-specific indexing and search, we've applied it to human trafficking first because we think it's a place that we can make an impact. We think it has many of the technology challenges. And because when I run around uh, to the government and to different parts of uh, the law enforcement community, what I saw is what I'll show you next, how they're solving problems now, 
and it was a, it was a frustration. So the first way in which ideas come to be sometimes is when you observe people that are frustrated. So if you're a law enforcement person, often what happens is you get a tip, like in this case, an email address. And what do you do? You're looking for evidence of trafficking. You go to Google, and you click on the first link. Everyone clicks on the first link. You see a, a map. You see some blue bars. You see, you know, is that a, evidence of trafficking? You're not sure. Uh, you go back. Maybe you, you click on a different link. Uh, in this case, there's a bunch of character encoding issues, a bunch of location names. Is this evidence of, of a victim of human trafficking? How, how can you tell? Uh, maybe you go back, and, and, and third try is the charm. Uh, you click on, if it's playing still, you click on um, a third ad. And of course it fails. Uh, if you click on a third ad, maybe you see something like demographic information. And, and the point I'm trying to make here is that this process of, of searching and clicking and linking and cutting and pasting is the mechanism that everyone uses the internet for right now. I mean, how many of you have done sort of research projects and done this, where you have a bunch of tabs open, and you click on a bunch of links, and you go back and forth, and you cut and paste to a, a Word document or to Excel or PowerPoint? This is the state of the art for most analysis tasks, and it prevents complex questions from being asked. The way you ask questions is fundamentally enabled by the way in which you can get answers. And so if you're asking questions only the kind that you can answer using Google searches, then you're going to be really limited. And, and, I, and I'm sure that you all watched the video, but I doubt you noticed that on every web page that I showed there, uh, there was one phone number that was the same, actually. And so for an investigator, you know, you're looking at these websites. They have hyperlinks. The hyperlink is what an author determines is a link between two pieces of information. But it turns out for investigators, the content which is shared across web pages, things like phone numbers and images and addresses and email addresses, those are really important for following the leads. And so in that video, it's really hard to see as a person that there's one phone number that's the same on all those pages, but it's really easy for computers. So the first, again, mechanism for causing an idea is this frustration, watching people do this cut and paste process and know that modern technologies can help solve the problem. The second one is a, is a question of, of scale. Here we're looking at a map of the United States. I already earlier zoomed into Oklahoma, but if I look at a different place like New York where one of our partners is, there's 631,000 ads for sex online seen in the last year. They have, they have five analysts whose job it is to follow up investigations, to support those processes, to encourage subpoenas. If you have 600,000 ads in a year and five people, how, how do you look through them? How do you understand what's relevant? How do you understand what organization would have the biggest impact if it were a subpoenaed? Those kind of analysis questions you can't answer if you're Googling things one at a time. You need a different uh, paradigm for asking questions. And these kinds of search and interface tools are those kinds of uh, mechanisms. In this case, it's a map view. Sometimes it's a, a, a diagram of graphs. Sometimes it's a trend line. Uh, and here, it's not just in the US. It's global. You know, here, we're looking at India and Southeast Asia. Here, we're looking at Europe. Uh, all over the world, wherever there is the internet, there are people advertising sex online. And connecting those ads to victims of human trafficking is an important law enforcement and defense problem. Now, in general, this is a problem which is global. And so we have to understand not just how it's happening on the surface web, but in other parts of the internet. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, there's this thing called the dark web or the deep web. And what that means really is there are parts of the internet where it's uh, easier to do things that are illegal because you can maintain your anonymity. Uh, and there are places where you can publish things more quickly, like in social media. And those are parts of the internet which you're not going to find when you Google things. And so to have a comprehensive strategy to address complicated problems like human trafficking, we have to enable technology to be part of it. And that technology has to reach into those parts of the internet which are, are harder to find. So for example, looking at social media, uh, this is a map of the world covering about uh, a billion uh, posts over about a six month time period. And to give you a sense for a billion, uh, a million seconds is about 11 days, and a billion seconds is about 31 years. It's a lot of information. It's really hard for people to understand. It's really hard to know what's going on. And so this really reflects things like population and communications infrastructure. But if we filter these things down to terms in the sex industry, the map looks a lot sparser. It looks much more, more manageable. And if we zoom into the United States and we look for what terms are being used where, we can see things like the difference between the use of the word escort uh, or prostitute. And what that does, by looking at where these things are posted, allows us to ask analysis questions like, 
where is there a place selling sex I didn't know about? Is that place near a place I did know about? For example, are people going from parlors two miles up the road to a hotel with the same girls and posting them there? Those kind of questions are really hard to answer if you're restricted to the same interface. So, so the second way in which ideas uh, can, come, can come from a, the scale of a problem, of really identifying the problem. When you're looking at 70 million ads for sex online in a year or a, a billion social media posts, you have to think differently about how to solve that problem, and that problem is big enough that it requires new, new approaches. Uh, the third way that ideas come is from looking back into history. So the program I run is called Memex. It's a term from the 1940s, from this article here, called As We May Think, written by this guy, Vannevar Bush. This guy was spectacular. He was the head of the Office of Science and Research and Development in the Department of Defense after World War II. He initiated, oversaw the initiation of the Manhattan Project. He wrote this article at the end of the war, right before he founded a billion dollar company called Raytheon. And in this article, he challenges the science community that when we're winding down from war, the thing that we should do is organize our knowledge. In this article, in 1945, he anticipates the web, uh, Wikipedia, hyperlinks, really far out stuff in the 40s. And, and one of the inventions he describes in this paper is called the Memex. It looks like this. It's a machine. He envisioned a machine that has spools of microfiche because microfiche was what you were using to do research in the 40s, that you would go to the library and you would sit down at this machine and have all of these spools of microfiche that covered all of these topics of research, and that as you do your research, you create a trail of knowledge that connects parts of the microfiche together as you, as you do your research. And at the end of the day, what you're left with is not just one spool of microfiche and one printout, but you have this trail of information that leads to knowledge. Now, now, this was really ahead of its time, and we're way past the days of microfiche, but this concept of, of trailing into the internet, of trailing into social media and to the dark web, creating the connections across content that lets you understand how to connect the dots for law enforcement investigations, for missing persons, uh, in general, for crisis response. That's what we're using Memex for now. When there's a crisis in the world, there's a flood of online content. Just take Liberia last year with the Ebola outbreak, or what's happening now in Iraq and Syria. Those are events in the world which people are going online, and they're posting all kinds of content, and we have to be able to understand what's going on if we want to make intelligent decisions. And so although we're not looking at a machine like this, this is the same kind of concept in the modern terms, using the scale of the problem, addressing the frustration of current people uh, to solve sort of important defense and national security problems. And so, you know, to close, since we're, you know, here at school, Oklahoma State, where I went to school, and uh, I went to the library here, and as I mentioned before, our, our thinking is often shaped by the way in which we can ask questions. That, that was the beginning of when the internet was taking hold, and, and before the internet, people were asking questions of librarians, of card catalogs, and that limited their thinking. Now we have the internet, we have Google, we have Microsoft, those are limiting our thinking. What I, what I sort of challenge you to do as, as academics and as supporters of academics is to imagine the kinds of questions you would like to ask if you had a different way to ask questions, if you could look across the internet and determine, I'm interested in this topic, find me all of the web pages about this topic and make it understandable for me, you would ask more rapid, more comprehensive, more diverse uh, kinds of questions, and perhaps we would all have a much stronger knowledge base. And so uh, thank you very much, and uh, go Pokes. <laughs>